Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. This episode's topic will be the recent discovery of a molecular volume knob that regulates electrical signals in the brain. This discovery was made in the beginning of November by a group of researchers at Dartmouth University. This discovery could have enormous potential in terms of helping with learning and memory. With me today, I have Dr. Michael B. Hoppe, an assistant professor of biological sciences at Dartmouth and the leader of the research team. Hello, Dr. Hoppe. Welcome. It's an honor to have you on the podcast. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's great to get the chance to talk with you, Sanjo. So before we begin, I think it's important for the audience to get to know about you and your research team that you worked with to make this discovery. So could you talk a little bit about yourself and your team who undertook the study? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the team first, because they're really the, uh, you know, the engines behind the science. So um, they're really uh, three people that played a, a pretty critical role in this uh, paper. And uh, my lab is right now as a team of two postdoctoral researchers, meaning uh, two people that have already gotten their PhDs and are doing some more training. Uh, two graduate students and a technician. Uh, and typically, although not during the pandemic, we usually have a number of uh, undergraduates working in the lab too here at Dartmouth. Um, so this paper actually involved an undergraduate, a graduate, and a postdoc. Um, so kind of like all three levels working together, which was really, really fun and such a like diverse and talented team. So um, I primarily have to say, uh, Dr. Inha Cho, who's uh, been in the lab now for five years, um, she was the leader on this project and did a, a large majority of the work. Um, but Lauren Panzera, who's uh, um, just completed her fourth year of graduate study, made several important uh, measurements too. And uh, Morvin Chin, who was uh, an undergrad um, in my lab, who made one of the important studies of neurotransmitter release at the beginning, finding this um, unique subset of ion channels. Um, and he's currently doing a PhD at Harvard, but he graduated from here now. You also asked about me. Okay, I can give you the short history here. Um, I was uh, born in Maryland, uh, raised mainly outside of Baltimore. Um, I didn't really have any scientists in my family, but I did really like math uh, growing up and became interested in science at the end of high school. Uh, I went to uh, uh, study biology as an undergrad at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. It's my first time on the West Coast. There was a lot of new experiences there. It was nice seeing other part of the country. Um, and uh, after college, I started working as a research technician at a place called the Volum Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. Made a lot of friends there who encouraged me to keep going in science. And um, a guy named Sebastian Barg was uh, kind of a mentor to me and helped uh, help me meet a researcher named Patrick Rorsman uh, at the University of Oxford. So I moved to England to do my PhD studies, which is a really um, uh, fun place to live. Met a lot of interesting people there, including a scientific hero of mine, Fran Ashcroft. Um, and then uh, after that, I had the opportunity to move back to the United States, to New York City. And I worked with um, uh, a scientist named Timothy Ryan at Law Cornell uh, Medical College uh, that's in Manhattan. Uh, Tim is, uh, you know, definitely a, a role model and, and helped me develop a lot of the science that I used to start my own lab here at Dartmouth, uh, which I've now been here for six years in New Hampshire. Uh, that sounds like an amazing um, experience that you had just traveling across uh, all these different places across the U.S. and abroad um, to find what you're studying at Dartmouth. So would you say that you and your team um, worked really well together uh, as a group, as a research team? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, pro probably like the team meetings is the most fun, even when we're frustrated or trying to understand a new result. Um, we, you know, we, we talk constantly. The lab is just across the hall from my office here. So doors are always open and swinging back and forth. Um, it really is a collaborative team effort. 
Uh, let's start off talking about the basics of your discovery and how it works. So what exactly is the basis of what is happening with this new finding um, in the brain that you and your team discovered? Yeah, so um, kind of one, one part that's essential to that is uh, the study revolves around these things called synapses. Um, so uh, synapses are actually uh, the connections between neurons in our brain, uh, as well as between um, nerves and uh, other tissue like muscle. So um, they're these really uh, fascinating outposts. Um, and to me, why they're really a fascinating is a lot of our body runs actually on electricity. So our, our heart, our brains, our pancreas, our muscles and synapses, um, are these little outposts along the, uh, fibers of the brain that we call axons and they convert electrical signals into chemical signals, which is, by chemical, I just mean the release of different neurotransmitters. So, uh, maybe some of your audience has heard of dopamine, serotonin, um, uh, glutamate, which is uh, something we look at a lot in this study. And so um, those are the chemicals that are released. And those actually uh, flow across a little space uh, between the nerve cells, uh, which is actually what we call call the synapse. Uh, and that small space there where the chemicals diffuse bind to the receptor cell, and they generate another electrical signal again. So this kind of like conversion of electrical, chemical, electrical, it, all that happens at a synapse, which I don't know, that kind of blows my mind, frankly. Um, but at the same time, like to just put a, a, an extra exclamation point on that, all of that occurs in less than a millisecond. So that's how we get the speed and precision of how our brains run. Um, so, okay, that that's neat. Why, why is there this particular interest in synapses? Well, not only do they perform this duty of... Um, converting electrical signals, but uh, they also have something that we refer to in science as plasticity. So the strength of the connection can change over time. And uh, this is thought to underlie learning and memory. So changing the strength of the connections is the most plastic part. Um, you know, essentially the number of neurons we have are fixed at life, uh, not too long after uh, birth. And there's a large development of the number of neurons, but essentially throughout adulthood we're fixed but we can continue learning throughout that time and it's all adjustments not in the number of cells but in the way they're connected and so that's kind of this like fundamental question in science um at least for me learning and memory are like the driving force of what interests me right and so um in your paper you um talk actually a majority about synapses and their importance um, like in regards to what you found. So um, now that we know what synapses are, what role did they play in what you had discovered um, that you wrote in your paper? Sure. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I told you all this synaptic transmission takes place just in a millisecond. And, uh, you know, as we talk right now, uh, most of the, the uh, neurons in our brain are firing at different frequencies. So uh, many times per second, they're talking with each other. And um, what was learned is uh, in many areas of the brain, uh, including the hippocampus, that's uh, like a, a center for learning and memory. And when certain nerve cells fire faster, the amount of chemicals they release with each electrical impulse gets larger and larger. We call that facilitation. And it turns out there's another group of synapses that do the opposite. When you drive them harder, each electrical impulse releases less. And we call that depression. And this kind of combination of facilitation and depression is, um, you know, really, we think, critical for how different patterns of brain activity elicit different reactions by changing this balance of the chemicals released in various areas. So uh, one question maybe would be, you know, why were we looking at this in the hippocampus? Um, and, you know, the reason for that actually is, um, has to do with a, a somewhat tragic story. Uh, so there was a young man um, in the early part of the uh, 1900s um, who suffered from epilepsy. And uh, it was untreatable by any drugs at the time. 
And so uh, this patient, they recommended surgery and removed two small parts of the brain where these seizures were emanating from called the hippocampus. Um, it's kind of tucked in the part of our cortex. So uh, the removal of these, uh, this hippocampal area on both sides of the brain stopped all the seizures when the patient woke up. But from that moment on, they were never able to form a new memory again for the rest of their life. Uh, and in fact, didn't remember anything three weeks prior to the surgery, but all other memories in the brain were intact. So th this young man, um, you know, ended up being studied for several decades. He lived a life of never forming a new declarative memory again. Every time he met the researcher was like the first. Um, and there, that patient's name is HM, and they're kind of decorated across uh, neuroscience textbooks now. Uh, but this stimulated a large interest in the hippocampus because HM was perfectly healthy in almost all other ways except the inability to store new memories. So like the race was on of scientists were just absolutely fascinated about what the hippocampus did. Why is that unique? Different regions of the brain are associated with language development or this or that, but to actually be a center of um, memory initiation was fascinating. And the initial physiologists who studied found that the hip, many neurons in the hippocampus that, that make the circuits, they exhibit uh, dramatic facilitation. And so this kind of the interest in what causes facilitation or depression um, kind of stems from that fundamental uh, discovery about the hippocampus and learning and memory. Um, and, you know, just finding out that these tiny little synaptic connections that are only a micron in size can exhibit these two opposite behaviors of facilitation, depression, you know, as a tinkerer, you want to know how, what, what molecules um, do this. So that was the, um, the impetus for our study, like the big questions uh, that were there that we really, um, along with many other labs, are, are interested in understanding. Um, so in your study, when I was, uh, when I was reading your study, um, as you, you mentioned that you were looking for a molecule that was able to um, like find these, um, like the way these synapses work and like change it a little bit. So you mentioned that, um, that you worked with one molecule that I'm not sure how to, um, how to pronounce, but um, that seemed to play a pretty monumental role in your study as well. Could you describe what that molecule was and what it did? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I'll say that, you know, the, the, what we were about to, to uh, look at studying was um, a somewhat uh, what I, would, I think many people, including myself uh, earlier in my career, would consider pretty boring. So if you look at a textbook, um, the electrical impulse comes and that generates the release of these packets of chemicals that we call vesicles. And um, many Nobel Prizes have now been awarded for finding those packets how they actually, um, they're kind of these little bubbles full of chemical, how they fuse with the uh, end of a nerve terminal to release the neurotransmitter. So um, it's been really fascinating and, and great progress in science to understand how those packets fuse. And my own textbook, when I was a biology major, demonstrated this of a little picture of a lightning bolt arriving and then all the cool stuff ha happening after the lightning bolt. But all the molecules that we've discovered for releasing this neurotransmitter so far uh, have actually been the same between depressing and facilitating synapses. So due to a few other observations, we became curious about what that lightning bolt is. So the formal name of this lightning bolt is something called an action potential. And uh, it was first discovered um, in or published in 1952 uh, by two, two researchers who uh, ended up winning the Nobel Prize and they they studied it in this very large nerve, nerve fiber from a squid. Uh, and so uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, they uh, were able to insert wires into this giant axon of the squid and record this action potential. And it's a little spike in voltage. But normally we convey, we think of electrical signals being conveyed by electricity. And that's the movement of electrons across a resistive material like a wire. But it turns out in biology, the electric signals are caused by these tiny little pores 
that are in the membrane of a cell. And when they open, positive and negatively charged ions like salts can move across and they convey a charge too. So electrical, biological energy is conveyed by the movement of sodium and potassium ions primarily is what Hodgkin and Huxley discovered. Positive sodium ions coming in increases membrane voltage and positive uh, potassium ions flowing out. So the loss of positive charge makes the, uh, the negative part. But it may be a lot of details. Um, but So excuse me, I do get lost in some of the details as a scientist. But this is kind of how we create a, a, an electrical impulse. So, you know, our question was, well, if this is true in the squid, we know it generally to be true in all, all nerve cells. What does this lightning bolt actually look like? Like, what's the shape of it? And that ended up being a simple question that was incredibly hard to answer. So the squid's axon, the reason they measured it here is it's about a millimeter in diameter. I know that's really tiny, but that's something you can actually see. And it's so big, you can actually have a very fine wire that's small enough to go in there. But the neurons in, in, uh, that make up our brains are you know, several times smaller than that. So they're only a few hundred nanometers wide. And so you actually can't measure them with any type of um, electrical wire or what we call electrophysiology in great detail. So actually finding what the shape of this electrical impulse is here is impossible. So we became curious, like, what does it look like? Is this maybe somehow responsible for these two behaviors of facilitation and depression? And um, this is really where like a lot of the teamwork and hard work came is um, a lab at Harvard uh, run by a gentleman named Adam Cohen. He discovered this beautiful property uh, of a protein uh, that's uh, kind of named a rhodopsin. And, and this molecule has inherent fluorescence and it gives off light based on voltage. So if you put it in the membrane, the higher a voltage is, the more light it gives off. So it's a fluorescent protein that emits voltage as light. And the the, this got us really excited because a wire, you can't make smaller and smaller and smaller, but a beam of light, a photon that can go anywhere, right? It's like the smallest thing known. So we kind of, uh, from seeing his publication uh, that you could monitor uh, fluorescence with light in a cell body, we figured if we changed our microscope a bit, we could measure this from these tiny fibers and actually see what the lightning bolt looks like. And uh, when we measured this lightning bolt, the shape of the waveform, uh, this voltage spike, so to say, sorry, waveform's a kludgy word, but it's just a spike in voltage. And it turns out that the, the spike shape changed, particularly in facilitating synapses. It would, if you drove them really hard, the spike got fatter and fatter, broader and broader. Whereas in the depressing ones, it was much more uniform. It actually maybe even shrunk a little bit. So we were shocked, actually. We never expected that. Um, we, we envisioned it to be kind of boring, and, and that's because um, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley had named these action potentials all or nothing. You either fire one or you don't. And how we think of computation electrical signals, at least in computers, is binary, zero or one. So you either have a spike or you don't. So nerve cells do, you know, kind of Shakespearean to spike or not to spike. But that electrical impulse, when it, where it's generated, can transform as it moves through the wire, unlike an electrical signal. Um, and, and so we, we saw it before our eyes changing shape between these two. And um, informed by the other result, we knew it was probably a potassium current that was doing this. And at that point, um, Inha solved it a little bit just by brute force and hard work of using a lot of genetic techniques to um, go through a list of suspects. And, um, uh, you know, I, if, if we had been better guessers, we would have come to it uh, sooner, but we just eventually found this candidate that was the main um, molecule we talked about in the paper called a KV beta subunit. And it's, you know, it's a charming name. It rolls right off the tongue. I'm surprised you didn't want to say it yourself for this KV beta one. Um, 
but it's actually like conceptually a really cool little protein. So I told you that ion channels are like little pores. So um, I know this is an audio broadcast. So what I'll say is these pores can kind of uh, open like an iris on a camera of like twisting open and shut. And this beta subunit is kind of like a, a little bit of a sneaker of a molecule. So it's a little bit of a ball and chain. And when that iris opens, this ball has the opportunity to go right inside of the hole, the opening of the channel and kind of lock it. So it puts it in a bit of a timeout. And this timeout takes a few milliseconds to drop out. But if a neuron's firing very quickly, a few of the potassiums can no longer contribute. So that fall and voltage of the positive potassium ions escaping, more and more of the channels get put in timeout by this beta subunit. And that causes the broadening or the slower change in the voltage signal. Um, and so, you know, how we figure that out is by removing that molecule. And when we did that in neurons, they no longer could uh, have the change in the, the voltage spikes. So now instead of getting broad, uh, they, the more we fired, they actually stayed uniform. And when we looked at the amount of neurotransmitter released by that, it was significantly decreased. So all the facilitation was absolutely gone. And so even though it was a really tiny thing that we measured and it was using a new technique that we all, all, all we imagined is that what we were measuring was true using light to look at voltage, but that's pretty new. But then we were able to confirm that those really must be significant because that lack of broadening stopped all the facilitation of neurotransmitter release. And unbeknownst to us at the time, as we just went through these suspects and found it, a previous report from uh, 1998, a group of scientists had um, gotten rid of this molecule in a mouse genome so that it was gone. And these mice had very poor ability to learn spatial mazes and engage in social learning behaviors for unknown reasons. So we were actually quite encouraged by that of, we find a molecule that we, you know, think is really important for this process of learning and memory. And then another group that we had no idea of, about had found that the loss of this protein, the mice were really poor at learning. Um, so yeah, that, that was a pretty exciting moment um, in terms of the relationship and what this KV beta one does. Right. And I think in your article that you um, wrote with Dartmouth University, um, you sort of summarized KV beta one and the molecule and what it does as um, sort of a molecular volume knob. Um, so could you explain what that um, what that summarization or what that term uh, means? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, I go back to that um, the idea of computers and transistors. So uh, a com computer makes uh, several you know hundreds of billions of computations a second and all zeros and ones. But when we look to find these zeros and ones, we found that they aren't digital, they're analog. So instead of thinking of this as a light switch, we would think of it as almost a dimmer. And so, you know, imagine the shock if you came into your kitchen and went to turn on the light switch. And if you flicked it on and off every time, instead of it just going on and off, the light got brighter and brighter and brighter the faster you flicked it. So. That's kind of the volume knob. So that, that was a, um, a term kind of extracted in a, uh, an interview with, with a writer here who helped try to translate our article so it was a bit better. And I, I really like that idea that, you know, the shocking thing is the electrical pulse that we think just turns something on. It actually conveys useful information that how much neurotransmitter release kind of like a knob instead of a, a light switch. So yeah, that's kind of where that term came from and how we think about this now. Right, and another thing that you um, also mentioned often in both articles um, is what this means for memory and learning and their functions. So specific to your project, um, what are the processes and methods that allow memory and learning to function and how are they affected by the system that you uh, studied in your research? Yeah. Um, no, that, that, that's a good question. Um, a lot of this is uh, somewhat basic science that was uh, extrapolated from the fact that 
Uh, this central process of facilitation is, is greatly damaged without the molecule. And then from the work of others showing that uh, the fruit fly, or so, I'm sorry, not fruit fly, the uh, mouse has these known learning impairments. And, you know, we kind of took it a step further uh, looking uh, at this. And the reason I bring up fruit flies is this molecule, this little ball and chain is incredibly conserved. Uh, evolutionarily. So it's even present in fruit fly all the way up to humans. And uh, we do know actually even the fruit fly without this molecule has learning defects and um, uh, actually it has insomnia as well. It has trouble sleeping. And humans, uh, we actually know of a, uh, a number of human diseases associated to this um, that actually aren't in the ball itself, but where the ball kind of goes into this iris of the potassium channel. So a number of mutations associated with epilepsy and ataxia, which is a trouble, a movement trouble. Ataxia has to do with gait and movement, uh, uh, have mutations there. And particularly the ones uh, that are associated with the potassium channel and where the ball and chain are, uh, these patients with ataxia also have trouble with spatial memory, which is a hallmark of a hippocampus. So um, we're hoping to kind of follow this up and actually move it forward to look more directly at uh, some other paradigms of learning and behavior next. But that is the, the impetus of why we're excited about the results. Right. And so now I sort of want to turn to a more, um, well, a more human side of the research, like sort of the perspective of you and the other researchers. So conducting research in such an advanced and unknown topic uh, such as this um, must have been super extremely difficult um, to carry out. So how was your research um, carried out, as, uh, especially during um, this time of COVID and social distancing? And also just in general, what led to the discovery um, that your team made during this time? I know you specified a little bit of it in one of the previous questions. So if you could just go more in detail with that. Yeah, I mean, um, the key is really in the team. I mean, you know, Inha is, uh, she's an incredible person and a, uh, an amazing scientist. So, you know, really like the, the thing that allowed Inha to, to perform this, this, uh, get these results and perform these experiments is uh, she sweats the small stuff. So she made tiny incremental improvements in almost every way that we uh, approach this question of uh, small adjustments to the, the microscope, small adjustments to how we um, put these um, optical voltage indicators into neurons and um, that, that really was the key that all these small improvements really added up. Um, you know, just with like a, a real, like, you know, part of creativity, there was just also like a lot of perspiration as well as inspiration in this discovery of just like actually really moving on this. And, you know, uh, Inha had published a paper just over two years ago, it set in motion a lot of this work. So the, uh, it was kind of like the first hint that there could be some real plasticity in these electrical signals. And uh, how you ask kind of like how the pandemic played a part in this. So um, really the effects of the pandemic on research, we're going to like be feeling those like in, a, in the next one to three years. Um, a lot of this study was all, I would say 98% of this study was complete uh, prior to the COVID pandemic coming. Um, so uh, most all scientific papers, they go in for peer review. So um, there were a few suggestions, uh, one really cool one that we love the results of on this paper. So we got those back in like December. And so we had started right after the holidays uh, going after uh, the, the suggested experimental paradigm by the reviewers to clear up one of our findings. And um, we were just about done as the pandemic came. So um, there was a delay, like we we probably would have published this in uh, March or maybe even April at the latest had it not been for, for this. So even that little small part, that really 
made it difficult uh, because of just access to the lab and the team was broken up at that point. So um, only one person was allowed in the building at a time for safety. So that just really slowed things down of like in how would come in, uh, perform an experiment, then a technician would have to come to prepare more neurons and instead of doing it on the same day, it was broken up everything of analyzing the results and discussing them was over zoom. Um, and you know, I'm uh, also uh, a father with two young daughters. So, and, and Inha herself is also a parent. So we were really juggling all the, uh, things together. Um, I'm sure, yeah, you know, you've experienced this on the, uh, on the end too, of going to classes now and all these things in a virtual environment, it's just different. And that makes it a lot, um, you're used to one thing and you can perform efficiently like that. So switching it was just the challenge in of itself. Yeah, it's definitely a whole new environment trying to transition to um, doing all of your research and um, finishing steps all online. So I can imagine how that would take um, uh, a lot of delay to figure out perfectly. Um, so now talking about um, you a little bit, what, influenced you to take on this study or to delve more into the relationship um, between like these synapses and then KV beta one or these molecules that you described? Was there like an inciting incident or did it just come about? Um, no, I, 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 yeah, that's, that's a good question. Well, I mean, uh, had you asked me what I would be working on in, in my lab at Dartmouth here, uh, when I started my postdoctoral research in New York, I never would have said this. Um, I, I was, I've, I've been, you know, admittedly, I've been interested in synapses like from, for quite a while, an embarrassingly long time, mainly due to a mentor as an undergraduate, but, uh, I did not, I was definitely in the camp that these lightning bolts were pretty boring. Um, mainly because so little was known about them. It was easier to assume that they were boring. Um, However, every discovery we made of trying to understand some of these processes of facilitation and what controls fusion, we kept getting little hints that we weren't getting the full story. There was a little fuzziness to the data. So we found you know, uh, a number of molecules that were important, but not specific to facilitation or depression and um, were interesting in their own right. but somehow they kept hinting that uh, this would make more sense if the electrical signal was what we would call plastic or not just binary. And so to keep getting those results from different experiments, it was just kind of a thousand cuts that led us to say, wow, we have to assume the impossible. What if the lightning bolt is not digital? What if it's just much more complicated? And that was a um, a scary thought to have because we also didn't know how in the heck we would prove it if that was true. So, you know, th this has really been almost a process of, of six or seven years of figuring out the ways to really make the measurements to understand what these processes do. And, you know, there's been some um, other really important labs uh, that have, we're also going into this weird world of if the, if the pulses are changing. So uh, there's a, uh, a lab in France run by Dominique Deban that was one of the first to, I feel like half the ideas we've had, we've looked and found inspiration from his work as uh, really one of the first groups uh, uh, to look at this. Um, and uh, a, a lab in Florida at the Max Planck, Jason Christie, there is a, a scientist, Matt Rowan in his lab that uh, did a lot of work um, in a different part of the brain, suggesting that these signals are uh, controlled maybe differently in the axon and soma as well, that we're, we were kind of working together at the same uh, time in separate systems, publishing work that um, supported each other, you know, not intentionally, but that kind of helped drive us to keep digging a bit deeper. Um, so, I mean, that, that's not going to be exclusive of, of the work of others, but that, uh, because I, I am always afraid of leaving others out. Uh, one other uh, really great uh, work was from a lab uh, in Japan, Shinya Kawaguchi, um, 
who uh, really made a suggestion that uh, depression could also be linked to these electrical signals. So all that kind of was brewing together made us looking at it uh, as a question. So I wouldn't I would say there were a couple um, steps, but no, um, like both in the middle of the night waking up aha moment, just kind of moving along in the scientific process, um, eliminating the easy things first. And then eventually you're only left with this uh, possibility that you think could could be it. So that's how, that's how we got there. Really a process of elimination. Right. And from what you described, this discovery has vast potential for combating uh, numerous neurological diseases or other problems involving learning, memory, and things like that. Um, so now talking about um, arguably one of the most important parts of a research paper, which is the application of it. Like, you know, you've made a discovery. What what can it, what can happen yeah, from what, this what discovery? Yeah, what can you do now? with that discovery, right? Um, exactly. So, yeah, that, that, um, that that's definitely a really exciting part for us, uh, too. Um, and, and, you know, going forward, that requires partnerships as well. Like, it's very hard for a small academic lab to move it forward in drug discovery, which is why that's larger teams. But finding out, so one part is kind, kind of like <laughs> painful and that finding these electrical signals themselves are actually really important. So they aren't just going to initiate this complicated process, they're going to inform it and guide the synaptic connections. But that's also really exciting because ion channels, which control these signals, they're like probably the most druggable target in the body. And I became fascinated by them actually because of poisonous critters. So it turns out that almost every venom or poison that's known in the animal kingdom that can affect us does so by through ion channels. So uh, the puffer fish, it's known to be toxic in sushi. That's a tetrodotoxin that blocks sodium channels. Uh, black mamba venom blocks the very potassium channel that we study. So all of these little pores are on the surface of the cell. So that makes them very accessible. If it's a molecular machine inside of the cell, then your drug has to get in inside of the cell too. But if it's a little um, pore on the surface, that's really accessible. And so um, we're excited because this molecule here was selective for only one of the types of neurons in the hippocampus. And that this molecule seems to mainly be interacting uh, just in the axon, not the cell body. So generating electrical signals is independent of it, but how they transform its synapses is unique. So that's, you know, just thinking on the surface of that, that's exciting because you have a molecule that's, a, that's easily accessible by chemicals on the surface of a neuron, and it seems to be unique, and that there might be unique combinations and different wiring of the brain. So that gives you a specificity to a potential drug design right there. So those things are kind of like um, really inspirational to us of finding even this black mamba poison, a crude, uh, well, I, I, let's not say that, an elegant venom but that, that, that does its uh, function crudely by, you know, damaging the, the electrical signals from a large class of neurons, even that only impacted one cell type in the hippocampus we looked at. So if you think about, you know, maybe that is a potential building block uh, to alter these little potassium currents and shaping the electrical signal, then you have a way to maybe tune the brain a bit more. Uh, in various parts where facilitation is impacted or in the opposite direction, going back to HM, responsibilities for imbalances in electrical signals that are uh, related to epilepsy. Uh, so that's, um, that's kind of the application part where now that we know a unique molecular combination and ion channel, we can kind of start to... Um, maybe screen like a, a various uh, approved compounds that can affect that or um, combining with structural biologists to find out what may be a way to uniquely get, get at that. So um, that's where we think some, um, some really important parts would come. What we'd like to know uh, 
is what other areas of the brain might rely on this mechanism. So how exactly specific is it? Does each kind of fiber or class of fiber in the brain have a different combination for its lightning bolt or is it shared? And that will let us know um, how useful various targets are. If that makes sense. Right. Yeah. So I guess that really um, sort of explains what needs to be done now in the application process um, with, with this discovery. So sort of as a conclusion now, I wanted to ask for you and uh, for your team, what, what comes next for, um, for you guys, for this discovery? Um, like what would you say is the next step for you guys to do to propel um, this information that you have now, this discovery uh, into these next steps of pharmaceuticals and drug development and these other things that this would prove to be useful in? Absolutely. Uh, okay, yeah, that's a good question. So um, one, uh, we'd like to know uh, what changes the expression of this molecule. So what are the circumstances? Is it upregulated in disease, downregulated in aging? Um, when, you know, uh, finding this mechanism, we want to know now more like outside of adicious cells, how that translates into the expression in organisms. So that, that uh, include mainly in humans at that point. So um, you can get a lot of information that's publicly available in databases now, the changing expression of uh, proteins in the brain throughout the lifetime, combined with animal research, um, we, we should be able to uh, get an idea of if this is more important for development or um, changes in aging. That's something that, that's really informative to us. So that's some work that Inha is, is taking on now. She wants to find out the factors that control this ball and chain to understand it better. Um, the offshoot of this is um, finding out that voltage is more than a light switch is a volume knob. We want to know what, you know, so maybe we just found treble, like what's base, what are the other equalizer knobs here to control voltage? We think this could be a really um, deep trove uh, of targets. And, and so we want to understand more about that when they're engaged, how electrical signaling um, works in a, in a more analog uh, system. So it's kind of flipped our view that we think um, if it's not black and white, what other hues and colors are there that paints this type of signaling in the brain? So that really fires me up, actually. And I, and I think a lot of the team, like, you know, they're just, I have a whole whiteboard full of ideas um, that kind of stem from this. Like if X is true, then what about all these other um, different mechanisms for altering voltage uh, that we think could, could be major um, other factors here, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that you have uh, all of these ideas that stem from this uh, one research uh, project. Are you and the people you work with planning on taking all of these on um, or just uh, looking at which ones are the most noteworthy and working from there, um, like regarding the stemming out of uh, this project? Yeah, well, I'm I'm hoping that Inha gets a chance to start her own lab. Um, I've been writing uh, lots of letters and, and helping her with applications. It would be uh, great to get smart people in charge of their own teams. I think that's the best way, allowing them to take ideas with them and start their own labs and careers. Um, the other part is uh, getting the chance to, to talk with uh, other people and spread the idea. I mean, uh, I told you we're a group of five people and we got 30 ideas on the board. That would take, I'd be dead by the time we'd look at all of them. So uh, collaborations are a lot of fun and we're engaged in a few uh, to look at the expertise of other labs. Um, and, you know, we, we also have our own, uh, I guess, slightly selfish and greedy aspirations. It is fun to look at these. So we might've cherry picked one or two we think we're in a good position to look at. Um, but yeah, any, anyone who, um, is interested, you know, we love to get emails like their own, uh, talk about this and, 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 uh, spread some of the ideas around because, um, 
it's very fun in science when people take your own idea and run with it and make something that's even bigger. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how it all works. And we're, we're all for that. Right. Um, that honestly sounds that there, like there's so much potential that could come uh, from not only this project, but everything that you've been working on um, in the past couple of years that you've been studying um, synapses and these molecules and just everything um, that they'd have to do with not only this project, but also with other things. So uh, Dr. Hoppe, thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. It was an honor to have you here. Good luck with um, what comes next with your project and your new um, project ideas that you have and stay safe. And thank you so much for appearing. Absolutely. Thanks again for uh, having me. It's been fun to have a chance to talk with you.